What is up, guys? Sergeant Argyre right here, and today I'm going to be reacting to Napoleon's Marshals, Part 4. I tried to record this earlier, a couple days ago, I think, but guess what? It decided that it didn't want to record the audio. So I'm doing it again. We're going to be stopping, like, around the halfway point. We're going to split in two parts, because otherwise, like, this video is already almost 30 minutes. Otherwise, the video would be way too long. Like, way too long. But without further ado, let's get started. Oops, that's about the point where I stopped. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's battle. In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. Good job. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as Marshals, with expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Rémy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. So far, we've met yeah, now we're about to get into, like, the really good generals. Earlier, it was, like, the above-average generals. Now we're gonna get into the really, really good generals, like, some of the best. Et Marshals Perignon. And I think this is gonna be the second-to-last episode. I mean, part. Should, after this, just should only be a part five. Brun, Serruier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau. Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Oudinot, Victor, and Murat. Who could be a more fitting video sponsor than Pain and stunning bags of Or if you're lucky enough to be in Paris. And thank you to Napoleon Souvenirs. This video. Nine, Marshal Bessier. I got another one right. Oh my gosh, got another name right. Oh, that's the general that like wasn't there on time or something. Jean Baptiste Bessier was the son of a surgeon, with a relatively prosperous upbringing in southwestern France. When the French Revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard and was sent to Paris to join the King's Constitutional Guard along with his old school friend, Georges-Jean Murat. This unit was soon disbanded, but Bessières remained in Paris and was among the soldiers defending the Tuileries Palace when it was stormed by the mob on the 10th of August, 1792. In the aftermath, he needed to get out of Paris in a hurry, so he volunteered to fight on the Pyrenees front. His bravery and good sense won him a commission in the 22nd Chasseurs, and he distinguished himself at the Battle of Boulou. Transferred to Italy, his friendship with Murat got him noticed by the army commander, General Bonaparte, who was impressed enough to make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Bessier distinguished himself as a cavalry commander in Italy, and later Egypt, winning promotion to brigadier and loyally supporting Napoleon at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon regarded as a true friend. When Napoleon became first consul of France in 1799, he rewarded Bessières with command of the elite consular guard cavalry, which he led with devastating effect at Marengo the next year. In 1804, Bessier became a marshal, less for any great military achievement than for being a loyal member of Napoleon's inner circle. 
Bessier himself was well-liked, kind, well-mannered and generous, a pious Catholic and social conservative who liked to powder his hair in the old style. His young wife, Marie Jeanne, was also a favourite at court, doted on by Napoleon and Empress Josephine. In 1805, Bessier commanded the Imperial Guard. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, he played a crucial role repelling the Russian Guard at the battle's climax. At Eylau in 1807, his squadron supported Murat's mass cavalry charge and made their own disciplined attacks to cover his withdrawal. However, Bessières' opportunities for glory were limited. Napoleon always held the guard back as his last reserve, as at Friedland. In 1808, Bessières received his first major independent command in northern Spain. That May, the country erupted in revolt against the French. Bessières reacted quickly and decisively, securing key towns and roads. He then attacked Spanish forces at Medina de Rio Seco, winning a crushing victory against an enemy that outnumbered him two to one. But once the immediate crisis had passed, he hesitated and failed to exploit his victory. When Napoleon arrived in Spain, Bessier was given command of the reserve cavalry, a role he retained for the war against Austria in 1809. In May, Bessier and his cavalry were among the first across the Danube, with Massena occupying the village of Aspern on his left and Lann holding Essling on the right. When the Austrian commander, Archduke Charles, launched a massive and unexpected counterattack, Bessier, outnumbered four to one, made a series of desperate charges, helping to save the army from disaster. It came at a high cost. Bessier and his cavalry performed bravely. But that night, a long-running feud with Marshal Lann nearly came to blows when Lann accused Bessier of hanging back. The matter went no further, as Lann was fatally wounded the next day. Bessier commanded the cavalry again at Wagram, leading a major attack to cover Massena's redeployment to the left wing. As the charge began, a cannonball killed Bessier's horse and injured his leg. A rumor reached the Imperial Guard that Bessier was dead. Some old veterans began to weep for their old commander, until they were assured he was only wounded. That was quite a cannonball, Napoleon told Bessier. It reduced my guard to tears. As a devout Catholic- Seriously, there's so many freaking cannonballs that kill people in this. Like, how many times in this series so far have we heard about generals dying to freaking cannonballs? Like, not, a mus not like a musket or a rifle, a cannonball. So like, Bessier was critical of Napoleon's divorce from Empress Josephine, leading to a short spell out of favor. In 1811, he was sent back to Spain to command the Army of the North. He found an impossible situation, a widespread insurgency and insufficient troops and supplies. He wrote bluntly to Napoleon, stating that the French must give up territory, something the Emperor would never allow. Yeah. For all his piety and refined manners, Bessier ordered his share of executions and reprisals in his attempt to pacify northern Spain. Brutal methods used by many French commanders in this conflict. Later that year, he joined forces with Marshal Massena's Army of Portugal to take on Wellington's army at the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro, but was widely blamed for refusing to send in his cavalry to support Massena's attacks. Unfortunately for Napoleon, this was typical of how many marshals behaved in his absence. They'd rather watch another marshal fail than help them to win all the glory. That is stupid. In 1812, Bessier accompanied Napoleon into that Russia, helps. commanding his guard cavalry. Since the guard was kept in reserve, he saw little action until the retreat, when he led the advance guard, clearing a path for the survivors. 
The disaster in Russia left Bessières severely demoralized. But he was resolved to do his duty, now serving once more as Napoleon's cavalry commander, in Marshal Murat's absence. On the 1st of May 1813, Bessières was scouting enemy positions before the Battle of Lützen. Oh look at the, he, he died in 1813, that sucks. He died like two years before the war even finished. Oh my gosh. When a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. His death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander oh and one of his last remaining friends. It is surely a great loss for you and your children, Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. Okay, that just sounds kind of weird. Eight. Marshal McDonald. Marshal McDonald. That one's pretty easy. Wait, that sound doesn't sound like a French name, though. Good and brave, but unlucky. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a French name. Jacques McDonald. This is probably gonna be the last one, or maybe I might stop, like in the middle of this. Yeah, this will be probably the last one. His father was a Scotsman who'd supported Bonnie Prince Charlie's bid to seize the British throne in 1745. After this ended in defeat. Oh, this guy lived a while in 1840. Eat at Culloden. Also, it's kind of annoying how they put, like, Germany. Like, what the heck does that even mean? That's such a dumb. Like, why do they call it that? Germany wasn't a country back then, and it's confusing. Because they could be either referring to the Holy Roman Empire, you know, or maybe the Ger or maybe the German Confederation. Obviously, they don't mean that now. Because the German Confederation is later. But I mean, like, just in general. Like, it's really confusing, because... Or it could also be referring to Prussia. Like, any of those countries. It just makes it really confusing. The family fled to France. Like, if you're gonna say it, say, like, Prussia, or at least one of the states in the Holy Roman Empire, something like that. Inspired by tales of the Trojan War, MacDonald chose a military life and became a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish Regiment, a French unit made up mostly of Irish emigres. Oh, in the Revolutionary War... I saw his name, is that... Wait, so MacDonald is, like, from Ireland? Is that, is that where the name comes from? Was he won a reputation as a hard-working, intelligent, and brave officer, That's and cool. served as aide-de-camp to General de Maurier, commanding the Army of the North. He distinguished himself in that general's famous victory at Jemap, paving the way Jemap? for... Jemap? Where, where, where's the E and the S? What's when you've been having an E and an S and an extra P? Why? Rapid promotion Why from lieutenant it? to general in just two okay. years. Why does why do, why do the French have to have these, like, redundant, redundant letters? Just why? Yes. He led his division well during campaigns in Holland and Germany, and formed a close bond with one of France's most successful commanders of this period, General Moreau. In 1798, he was sent to Rome as governor, and later commanded the army of Naples. Summoned north the following year to reinforce Moreau's army. Wait, how can he be a governor of a city? I thought governor was like a, for a state or something. Wouldn't he be like the mayor of Rome then? What? Army of Italy. He was nearly killed in a skirmish with Austrian cavalry. And while still suffering from his wounds, his army was defeated at the was its own like state or little puppet country or something like that, I don't know. Trebia, by a larger coalition force commanded by the great Russian general Suvorov. Oh, Trebia, I think I may, might have a video about that. I don't know for sure. But MacDonald's own conduct won approval from General Bonaparte, among others. Oh. Later that year, he assisted Napoleon's seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, ensuring the loyalty of the troops at Versailles. He was rewarded with an army command in Switzerland, and that winter led his men through the Alps to attack the Austrians in Italy. His march was far more challenging and dangerous than Napoleon's. 
but was never immortalized in quite the same way. In 1804, Macdonald's former commander, General Moreau, was arrested and charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate Napoleon. Macdonald stood up for his friend's reputation, an act of loyalty typical of the man. What about your freaking loyalty to your to the leader of the of your country, of the person that made you a marshal. But disastrous for his career. Yeah, that would make sense. Moreau was exiled. Macdonald was oh, exiled. Placed under police surveillance Dang. and retired to his country estate in disgrace. Five years passed before Napoleon, desperate for experienced senior commanders, asked him to serve as military advisor to his 27-year-old stepson, Prince Eugène, now commanding the Army of Italy. Macdonald and Eugène worked well together, driving back the Austrians, and by an awesome feat of marching, joined Napoleon near Vienna in time for the Battle of Wagram. The second day of the battle was Macdonald's moment. Entrusted by the Emperor with the main attack on the enemy center, he formed his troops into a giant, open-backed square and advanced into a hail of fire. Napoleon, watching through his telescope, exclaimed several times, What a brave man! What a brave man! Macdonald's costly attack helped to secure a great victory. The next day, Napoleon went to find him on the battlefield and greeted him with the words, Let us be friends from now. You have acted valiantly and given me the greatest services. On the battlefield of your glory, where I owe you so large a part of yesterday's success, I make you a Marshal of France. You have long deserved it. In addition, Macdonald received the title Duke of Taranto and a large pension. But as time would prove, his loyalty remained to France, not to Napoleon. Macdonald spent an unhappy year in Catalonia, commanding troops in what he regarded as an immoral war. In his memoirs, he even praised the noble and courageous resistance of the Spanish. In 1812, he was given command of 10th Corps for the invasion of Russia. This corps, composed of German troops and reluctant Prussian allies, guarded the left flank of the invasion and had a relatively quiet campaign. In December, the Prussians suddenly agreed an armistice with the Russians, leaving the loyal remnant of Macdonald's corps to fight their way back to Poland. By 1813, Napoleon relied Probably after this last, like, comment, I'm gonna the video. on Macdonald as one of his senior marshals. Actually, hold on. How long is it? Until it's the next marshal. Oh my gosh. Looks like a lot. Yeah, I'm not gonna wait that long. In August, he gave him command of the forces keeping watch on General Blücher's army of Silesia. But when Macdonald advanced across the Katzbach River, torrential rain and flooding caused chaos among his troops, just as they encountered Blücher's army. Blücher launched an immediate attack, and Macdonald's army was routed. Thousands of his new conscripts surrendered or deserted. Hundreds were driven into the river itself. Macdonald took full responsibility for the disaster, though his lack of cavalry and some bad luck were also to blame. Well, it's not like the casualties were completely insane on the French side. Like, an 8,000 difference isn't, you know, humongous, but still, wow. Napoleon certainly continued to respect Macdonald's military judgment. Probably gonna end it here. I'm gonna record part one and part two today at the same time. That way, brightest are done. Like today, you can watch it right now.
watch part two right now. So, yeah, thank you all for watching. Stay tuned for part two of part four. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And, you know, turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you didn't, then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down. But yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not, better than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know, or I have in high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So, thank you for watching, and have a great day.